Well, welcome everybody to the seventh in the coffee series created by the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership at Seton Hall University. I'm Reggie Lewis, the center's executive director, and it's great to greet you from our campus here in South Orange, New Jersey. The coffee series provides an opportunity to showcase the inspirational stories of servant leaders. Each of our guests has deepened our understanding of the promise of this leadership philosophy and the endless ways in which individuals, organizations, and society in general can be transformed for the better. And I assure you, our guest today will not disappoint. Here to kick off our September webinar, I'm so pleased to introduce Richard R. Pieper Sr., Chairman Emeritus of PPC Partners, a national general electrical contracting firm headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Founded as Pieper Electric in 1947 by Mr. Pieper's father, Julius Pieper, the company has grown from a team of three men to its current makeup of well over 24 companies within the PPC Partners corporate family. Today, PPC has over 2,000 employees and generates millions in annual sales with sites in such locations as Wisconsin, Minnesota, Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. In 1960, Mr. Pieper assumed the helm of the company and PPC has flourished, certainly flourished under his leadership, growing from 1 million in sales in 1963 to over 34 million by 1989. But as the company prospered, so too did its employees. In the spirit of servant leadership, Mr. Pieper prioritized the well being of employees and ensured that all workers had opportunities to grow toward their full potential. He introduced continuing education benefits, stock offerings for employees, and used such practices as an accident free campaign zone to create the safest workplace environment possible. In becoming Chairman Emeritus of PPC Partners in 2018, Mr. Pieper has continued to manifest a servant's heart in everything he touches. It was his vision that led to the execution of the 2021 International Servant Leader Summit, the largest gathering of servant leader practitioners in the history of the movement. And through his family's philanthropy known as Legacy Investment for a Virtuous Society, Mr. Pieper has personally sustained efforts to promote the awareness and practice of servant leadership throughout the world. And we are particularly grateful for uh, the largesse of the Pieper family here at the, servant, at the Center for Servant Leadership at Seton Hall University. But given all that he does, and despite all of the time consuming efforts that he lends his heart to, Mr. Pieper still finds time to serve as trustee emeritus and past board chair of the Greenleaf Center and he always makes time making himself available to give me solid advice and support. And I am personally grateful for that. But before we begin a quick word about the center, we were founded in 1964 and for well over 50 plus years, we've worked to promote the understanding, practice and awareness of servant leadership, a philosophy in which the leader first seeks to serve. The center's portfolio now includes five signature programs, including the Greenleaf Academy, which supports professionals in deepening their foundational knowledge of servant leadership. The Greenleaf Scholars Program, which provides small mini grants to support scholars doing research on servant leadership. The Coffee With series, which showcases inspirational stories of servant leaders like our servant leader feature today. The Next Generation Initiative, which exposes high school students to principles and the practice of servant leadership. And soon the first annual Robert K. Greenleaf Public Policy Lecture, which will kick off in November by convening thought leaders and issue experts to address significant societal challenges confronting our nation today. You'll learn more about our programs. You can learn more about these programs by visiting us at greenleaf.org. And of course, I'll say a bit more about how you could become more involved with the center as I close out today. But we're going to begin, and uh, I'm going to ask our guest, Mr. Pieper, are you ready? Have you got your coffee ready on your end, sir? I am ready. <laughs> Actually, it's water. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, and for our guests, please feel free to load all of your wonderful questions in our chat and Q&A uh, feature, I should say. Uh, we'll begin by asking Mr. Pieper a bit more about uh, his background. Uh, so many of us know that uh, uh, your beloved Milwaukee is your uh, hometown. Um, how did Milwaukee shape the Richard Pieper that we've come to know today? Well, I, I, I have the earliest memory, which people told me, but I don't remember it actually. I was on a main street in the northwest part of the city, born in my grandmother and grandfather's house. And uh, my mom and dad lived there as well for months, I guess. And uh, I'm purported to have been in diapers out on the main street directing traffic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have another memory in that same house uh, that my grandfather actually built. Um, and it was out in the wintertime. My dad worked nights on the police department during the depression and that snowed. We used to get a lot of snow, but now we don't get so much. And I would made a snowball and I was throwing it at cards and one went by and I hit it right smack in the middle of the door and they slowed down and I was so frightened. I could hardly contain myself. I ran in the house, ran upstairs, crawled in my dad's bed for the rest of the day. <laughs> that was pre-kindergarten. <clears throat> we, um, we moved in a duplex downtown and, um, and we're in during kindergarten, I would say beginning first grade and uh, have a lot of memories there. It was World War II. Um, I don't know why this inclination of mine is to start things or do things, but uh, I, I had no allowance. I had to work for anything I made and it wasn't excruciating, they made it easy. But I came up with the idea of collecting fat was you had grease on your on your uh, grills and you pushed it to the back and then it collect you collected it in a can and it would congeal and then you'd put it in the garbage. <clears throat> Instead, I went around and had family and neighbors uh, keep that for me. And I went around with my coaster wagon, put all the fat in a coaster wagon, took it down to the butcher and sold it to him because they use that. <laughs> did something similar with newspapers. Uh, had a great time in the city. Then we moved out in the country in a farmhouse on US 41. I mean, out in the country, farmhouses all around us. And there we had a couple of acres and, and there I, had, I was able to cut the lawn and, and made 25 cents an hour cutting lawns. Uh, and then I also had a plum orchard. Uh, the trees look horrible, but the plums were terrific. I did nothing to trim them, uh, nurture them, kill the disease, nothing. But I, I had that out on US 41. And at night I had lights on it and I sold all the plums off 40 plum trees. And I had so much money every day, I couldn't get it all in my toy cash register. But everything I made went into the bank and I recorded it in my bank book. So that was the beginning, you might say, of my economic education. It, it sounds like the beginning of uh, the young peeper entrepreneur, I mean, and also one inclined to take charge early on. Somehow I can see you in your diapers directing traffic. That <laughs> There's a, another side of me that uh, is socially motivated, and I attribute it to these kinds of things. I had an aunt who uh, had tuberculosis, and at the time they they would collapse your lung. And the way they do that is they would cut one rib at a time out. Horrible kind of thing, but that's, she survived. <clears throat> and every time uh, she came home on holidays, um, she would, I never remember her being anything other than in a bed. I don't remember her getting to the kitchen table to eat turkey or, or Christmas time. But within 48 hours, uh, she, an ambulance would come and they'd take her back. But in between, uh, she'd take some shots that would kind of help her with her breathing. And she thought I should be a doctor. Now this is kindergarten. <clears throat> and uh, so she'd give me a needle and she said, now here's what you do. You take that and you just push it in my veins and then push that in. It was frightening. But she said, no, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You're gonna be a doctor one day. So I followed my aunt's directions. I, pushed it into her veins and I 
pushed the material in and took it back out. Um, I empathize with that aunt. Uh, I sold things for her. We made little stuffed animals for spending money in the hospital. And we lived next to a nursing home then. And uh, this is back in their city house. And the nurses thought I was a cute little thing and they bought all my stuffed animals. <laughs> and that kept her in her spending money. Um, back out, out in the country, grade school, um, bike, Northwest winds, which are severe in the wintertime around here. I just drive my bike right into that potholes on US 41. Bang, 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 all the way there. My face hurting by the time I got to school, but that's where I did my dreaming. Mm. All the things I could do in the world. I mean, I, my head was just all over the place. Mm. Uh, but I remember doing a lot of dreaming in that bicycle. Wow. Uh, and that was grade school. Um, I was in the scouts. Mm -hmm. I remember sitting up on my bed. I was on a second floor of the farmhouse. And uh, I ended up always being planning my patrol meetings. And then outings, you had to plan your outings, the food, all that sort of things. That's what patrol leaders are supposed to do. Uh, I remember in the steam tunnel of that school, teaching us how to make flies to go fishing with. Uh, the, uh, in the winter time, we had the Christmas wreath sales to raise money for the troop. I seem to always be top, top seller. Uh, it was a, uh, a very good uh, childhood. My closest neighbor and my friend was blocks away. I remember some crazy stuff going on with the farmers. Uh, one guy hung himself. Hmm. I mean, that was a, a, a world I had never known about. <clears throat> Another farmer had in his barn, we'd go sneaking in the barns, a stagecoach and another horse-drawn carriage kind of thing. And we played all kinds of games in these, uh, in these uh, barns, and in the fields, camping. Uh, put packs on our bike and we'd go two blocks away and we had a big camp out. <laughs> um, the country... I guess I was out 76 blocks plus 72 blocks from the city. But I'd get on my bicycle and I'd drive through the city. And I always was curious about all these neighborhoods. There was quite a difference between one neighborhood and the other. And then some were kind of, what's going on here? And I'd finally get down to the museum, which is right downtown. And I'd look at all their diorama and their exhibits. I was just fascinated for some reason. I'd just sit there and hang out looking at these exhibits. I remember one time I went to the dentist, I broke my tooth, I had to get a piece of gold put on it. And um, I was in the penny store and I would just study people, literally. I'm just a little guy, I'm, you know, my head is just up to the counter, a little bit above. So I'm looking at this one lady, just curious about you know, what is she, what's she doing, what's she thinking? And she turned around to me and she's, why are you looking at me? She was really angry and, and defensive. Oh, I didn't even know I was doing it, but I had a curiosity for people. My mother uh, during World War II was a, a nurse's aide. And after the war, she always took elderly people to the hospital and um, a kind of a program in town that did that. My dad was always helping somebody out. Uh, it could be a neighbor, a relative. They never paid him back, uh, but he did it anyways. Uh, that was my early childhood. And, and, a, rich, I, and a rich childhood, a rich childhood indeed. And, and you had the example of a servant in your dad. And so I think a lot of folk are curious as to, in addition to the example of your father, if you could just say more about how you were actually introduced to Robert Greenleaf and the philosophy of servant leadership. Well, <clears throat> well I got to tell you one more story. Okay. <laughs> At kindergarten age, my mother sends me out to Seattle for my grandmother and my uncle. And she, she'd never been to the airport before. Went to the airport and she was nervous as the Dickens and we were late. The plane had taken off, Northwest Airlines, but... This was a publicity deal for them. They called up the pilot and he said, uh, this peeper kid is here. 
what do you want to do? I'll come back down and pick them up. <laughs> and so I was a special character uh, sitting on their seat and steering the plane and on their sh pilot's shoulders going to the men's room when we made our stops all the way out to Seattle. Now, I will tell you that uh, the goodness and the people around me came out. Mm. Um, they were all helpful. Uh, they, I had an uncle that um, taught me about the stock market. And we had a artificial real stocks, but I didn't buy any. And he would say, just buy at the low and sell at the high. Every time I ask him, what about this? What about that? Buy at the low, sell at the high. So it began to get me involved in a commercial community, you might say, of sort. Now, we go on to high school, which was a correspondence course. There I had a ran a bait shop, uh, a bunch of things. And all those were seeds. I saw people that had tough lives, very successful people. But they'd go to the, now we're in the Florida Keys because I had a, an allergy uh, for a while. And my father and my mother, and we went in the sun, it would disappear. Mm -hmm. So we moved down to the Florida Keys and my mom started her real estate operations. And uh, so I, I worked for this guy who had this big boat and he'd take people out, Army Corps of Engineers, you take them fishing. They called it the rum runner. It looked like a rum runner and 65 foot boat. And we troll or bottom fish. And I would put the fish on the hooks, take the fish off all that. You know, you want to kosher pickle or not, that kind of stuff. And uh, by gully, the Corps of Engineers a year later, cut a path through one of the keys so that the Gulf and the ocean could be connected. Wow. Uh, another fellow came down, retired early, had a lot of money evidently. And I, at the time I worked for a builder then and uh, electrician plumber. And I was doing all this plumbing in this motel, but the plumber that's supposed to supervise me was never there. Mm -hmm. He'd come in once a day, here's what you do. So I did the plumbing in this whole hotel. After it was all over, I found out he was at the local bar drinking all the time. Okay. <laughs> People came down there to solve their problems and they, did, they followed him. So I became very conscious of people. Mm. Um, now, if you want to go over to Greenleaf, uh, that whole, you know, that it, it's, it's a natural feeling, uh, as Greenleaf says, it's a natural feeling. So with that kind of nurturing, I think, was had something to do with it. Uh, we're always helping somebody out. Uh, not foolishly, but uh, cautiously. Uh, 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 with, with a heart, with heart is what it amounts to. It. And Greenlee said, it's the natural feeling. Now, I'm in business. I start the business up and somebody sends me a book. I actually have it here. This is the book. Uh, let's see if I can get it out there. There it is. And this, The Servant Leader. The 1977 publication. It is. Yes. God, that's very good, Reggie. Uh, <laughs> I estimated I got it in 1990. Okay. From somebody I don't know who it was. But I went through this book and I underlined everything. And uh, we had the inclination to run a business with the ethics and virtues mm. of the Old Testament, and the example of Jesus, not religion, Jesus, his example. Um, got a lot of iterations in that area uh, about people approaching us and testing it. Uh, but I went through the book and I underlined, and it was sure a lot of the things we were doing. Mm -hmm. And then I got five more copies, underlined them, gave it to our, what we called it, our, our leadership group. And, uh, we spent the morning, two hours, talking about these statements, and we all agreed that's what we're doing. Then that book got put on the shelf, <laughs> and we came to the point where we were going to become an employee-owned company. <laughs> that was a decision we were making. And in the process of that, uh, we had a list of companies who were employee-owned more than 50 years. There I met um, TD Industries, Jack Lowe, yes. and he said, Paper, you should, you should be a member of the Greenleaf Center. Then after we finished talking, he says, 
I'm going to send you a membership. I'm going to put you a membership. And that got me into that. After several years, I finally got to a conference. I was overbooked over, you know, everything. Pursuing excellence all the time. The stewardship model. Yes. I've been given a lot of things. What am I going to do with them? How well am I going to use what I've been given? And I, I've kind of conducted my way all, all through my life. It keeps you overbooked for sure. Um, so I went to a conference finally. It was in Indianapolis. And by golly, this was, there was an issue in my mind. How are we going to transmit in some kind of an organized way to the next generation mm. what they don't know and pass it on? And the whole body of knowledge of Greenleaf and the scholars that were evolving there uh, made so much sense. The stories from other companies. Um, and so I, they rather quickly uh, reeled me into the board. And then not too far, much later, I end up being chairman. And uh, so there, it, 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 the people that I met and still meet are rich, gorgeous people. They got substance. Uh, they come together in a natural way hmm. and they, they read each other. It's a, it's a fun place to be. Um, so that started in the business. Uh, we quietly uh, absorbed that. Then I came to the point where I was getting my replacement CEO and I'm trying to figure out how to, and I take him to a conference and that was it. Man, he was full blown buying books, everybody got books all the time from him and uh, attempted to practice servant leadership, which isn't, it, it's an art more than it is a science. Hmm. And it's, not, uh, it's not easy, but in the long run, it is the easiest. In the short run, you know, using a, a velvet hammer or a hammer is one way of leading. But we're gonna have a speaker, uh, president of the university, who is going to describe just 10 years ago how that worked for him mm. and what's happened in his school and how he's operated because of that natural feeling. Everybody has it. How do you nurture it? How do you bring it out? How many were close to it because of experiences? Those are all the things to be managed. Uh, solid philosophy. Uh, that natural feeling is a, is a huge, huge you, you've got to discover it. You've got to nurture it in others and see what happens to them. Uh, so the re CEO replaced me, took that and ran with it. And we got involved in the Greenleaf Center. Can you say more, Mr. Pieper, about um, the ways in which PPC partners, and I was fortunate to visit with you and others uh, uh, in Milwaukee in uh, uh, July of uh, 2020, uh, to begin to get a sense of that massive and efficient operation. Um, talk to our guests about um, how PPC Partners has structured opportunities for employees to continue to nurture um, a focus on serving others um, whilst remaining safe and, and still helping the company to uh, remain profitable. A common... Uh ethos or conversation is lifting the capacity of others. Mm -hmm. And not everybody in the company lifts the capacity of others. And some people panic and, and resort to uh, what they may understand to be more effective for a moment. And that's, that's a tough deal when that happens for them. Um, but lifting the capacity of others, we believe in development of other people, mm -hmm. personally, professionally, um, spiritually and it can be spiritual or it can be faith we don't preach we demonstrate hmm. in my case I ask questions I'm kind of a one side of me is rose colored glasses the other side of me is asking these Socratic questions which some people go defensive on hmm. and so I have to manage that myself it's a, it's a it it's frequently a problem. I have to read it. Uh, there's a lot of things I look for. And then I go so far. The big thing that I've discovered is don't expect somebody to do something because you have them discover an insight. 
or because you ask a question and they don't give you any feedback. That's the really tough one. You don't know whether you've done any good. And if you can't read that, it's tough to know what next to do. But that uh, Socratic questions is my preference. Telling some stories. We all know about the value of stories. People tend to remember them. There's techniques. I'm not a great storyteller. I get stories to tell, but I am not a professional storyteller. Our son is though, he's really good. <laughs> um, and so it's a community, it's a family. You support each other. Interesting things happen automatically. Somebody's going through a divorce. Three or four people will come around that person. Nobody knows it and they surround them. Somebody has an addiction problem. They automatically sense it and people with previous experiences come around them and support them. Somebody dies in the family, a child, a mother, a spouse. People just automatically go to them. Uh, every major happening when I was CEO in a company of, of a major nature in somebody's life, I would send them a poem and a booklet that um, many, many people in the company and outside the company, if I hear about it, I'll send them a booklet. Uh, and it's the, uh, can't think of the name of it right now. It's very good. Uh, maybe I got it here. So your employees always knew you cared. That's so critical for the kind of leadership that matters. And, and the tough part is you get a reputation you can't understand mm. because you're just doing the right thing and I enjoy it. It's meaningful. Uh, but you can't understand the reputation and that's very intimidating to other people. Mm. Not, you know, I don't know what to do about that. Other than I use the word we a lot. Some people are talking about myself and say, well, who is we? Well, I guess that's me. <laughs> I just geared that way. Us, the team, a lot of different ways of saying it. But for sure, we are connected to the world and the universe. Every molecule counts. The negative and the positive, they make up the whole. And anybody that thinks they got it figured out, it's probably going to have some problems, uh, get some surprises. I have to remind myself daily. I do not have the answers as I'm working with things. And there's a lot of things that frustrate me. The same as everybody else actually, but I wanna do something about it. So I just work on the long-term. Foresight has been nicely emphasized in the, in the writings. Yes. Uh, and that's, that's a big one. Uh, I went to a class on foresight, a week long class. I wanted to understand it more took one of our executives with me and I wanted to know, how, can you learn it? Is it just born? And what I was told is 10 to 20% have it and probably closer to 10, 20% aren't going to get it no matter what you do. And the rest in between can learn how to do it. A bit complicated. Houston, University of Houston um, is where I went and they have a master's in this. Uh, but that foresight, the ability to look in the future, make sense out of it, communicate it to others, makes a job, uh, a sport, uh, and something that is meaningful, not a job. It's a, it's a way of living. And so you can take things very naturally and put them into that context. You know, we're in the electrical business. We service buildings, all kinds of buildings, uh, homes, schools, commerce, hospitals. Well, how does that affect society? Well, we do, a, we connect things up and they work. Well, I take it a step further. It is our responsibility in our society to reduce the costs in all of those venues. Schools, taxpayers, the least privileged, more money for them it can cost, reduce the cost. Hospitals, same scenario. Hospital expenses, you know, borrowing money to do hospital stuff. Um, all of the things involved in the whole process of medical, what, 
reduce the cost, make it more efficient, uh, deliver better. Mm. All that contributes to society. And the people most affected, most affected are the least privileged. Mm. They go from chicken to beans to rice mm. as, as, as the economy ratchets down. Every penny takes out of their hide. Uh, and so it filters down. Yes. And so I look at everything in that way. Uh, you know, we have a, a virtue situation in our world. Um, there's a lack of virtue. The founders of our nation said they studied a hundred failed city states, Greek, Roman. Reggie, I'm sure I told you this one. I think so. <laughs> and and they said, why did all these democracies fail back in the Greek Roman era? And they concluded the lack of virtue. Mm. So where does virtue come from? Jefferson Adams debate. Fortunately, the freedom of religion, they felt at the time. And I still, it's strong. A lot of people with faith background are attracted to servant leadership, but so are a lot of very ethical first-class people that have a spiritual modality in which they live and give. So um, we came up with the Greenleaf Scholars. Uh, wow, what a deal that was. Uh, never done anything so simple. And it wasn't just me. The seed was planted by one of our board members in the Greenleaf Center. I took that, moved it forward. Schools, higher education trains the leaders, likely or original thought comes out of those institutions and society absorbs it. So they set the pace. Teachers are, K-12 teachers are in schools. Now, if they are, what are they teaching? And there's a whole body of knowledge there, the evolution of this. And uh, by golly, the Greenleaf Center, uh, and I had the privilege of being associated with that, is sparking. We got the best, you, you now have the best a uh, researcher in the world as chair of your uh, yes. committee to select the scholars. And you got a young whippersnapper, maybe not that young, but who is, uh, he and a bunch of his buddies who were Greenleaf scholars are going to replace him. And the, the, uh, the amount of knowledge, papers, publications is exponentially going up. It's spectacular. Just so our guest knows, uh, the, the Greenleaf Scholars Program uh, uh, due uh, in large part to the, um, the largesse of the um, Peeper Family Fund uh, allows the center to select a number of scholars and researchers uh, each year, um, providing them small mini grants to uh, study and research in the area of servant leadership. And as Mr. Pieper um, is sharing with us, it's, a, it's an exciting program. It's growing by leaps and bounds. And we're so thrilled that our new chair of the Greenleaf Scholar Selection Committee is none other than Dr. Robert Lighton of the University of Illinois, Chicago. And so um, we're excited for all the things yet to come. Um, another thing we're excited about is building on uh, the good work of Mr. Pieper and the International Servant Leaders Summit Steering Committee and uh, for the benefit of our audience, Mr. Pieper, if you could share a bit about the vision behind the summit uh, and some of the things that you're most proud about with respect to, uh, again, I don't say this lightly, the largest gathering of servant leader practitioners ever. And scholars, practitioners, and curiosity seekers. That's right. <laughs> we had them all. And boy, were they engaged. It was, uh, we got very, very high marks. Absolutely. Uh, we had a lot of tens, perfect scores, and, and a lot of things over nine. So the quality was extraordinary. The, I think we had 144 resources, a little number of panels. Uh, we had 90 plus sessions, all recorded, uh, and, and for the use of the Greenleaf Center in the future, or research as uh, what really happened in those seminars. And, what kind of people and what questions did they ask? And we're grateful for that. And folks, this was June 9th through the 11th of this year. And we, and we ended up with uh, a virtual event, which 
had to hold everybody together for two years. <laughs> 300 registrants and, and uh, all of the people that signed up, almost all of them were there at the end. One died, another one head for the hills as soon as the COVID came out. And that was about it, a couple of others. Uh, but it's all recorded, the process is all there, uh, all run by volunteers and one pretty profound staff member and a temporary person uh, with all the paperwork and the, to record all this and put it on uh, google.com. Sorry, not google.com. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Google. Uh, been registered in those files and it's in the cloud and Greenleaf can do whatever they want with it. We're excited about that. So um, it was very successful. We are having meetings in Wisconsin with two ideas. One, to raise the visibility of uh, servant leadership in the world. Yes. And the one was to raise the Wisconsin movement up. And we've synthesized all that. And on the 22nd, I think we are, yeah, we're going to half day meeting with everybody that was willing to do a SWOT analysis on where we are. What did we learn from the summit? And what have we learned in the past? With all our surveys in Wisconsin, and uh, we will be coming up with a, a new approach or a modified or improved approach given the information. We're looking forward to that. We're going to shift now a bit to begin to take uh, questions in the chat feature and the Q&A feature as well, and we do have a question from a member of our audience who uh, is curious about your first encounter with Greenleaf Servant Leadership writings and teachings. If you could say more about your very first encounter uh, with Greenleaf's writings and teachings. That was when I read that book, uh, 1990, and um, it resonated. And it resonated, we, we went through this book together, spent a morning on it, and uh, high, off the highlights, each person contributed and that was, we could see where we were going to be able to sustain uh, the knowledge base with authority. Uh, it was seminal. It was seminal. And the next time is when we're doing, we're carrying out those principles in, in our own way. And Jack Lowe says, you ought to be in the center. Well, that, that put a whole new world into it. I don't know if that answered the question the way they were seeking it, but uh, it went click. It went click. You certainly answered the question. And, and, and as we wait for more questions to come in, let me exercise the prerogative of the chair by um, asking you to say a bit more um, in reference to some of your earlier comments about um, what motivated the creation of uh, perhaps the Lives Fund. Um, we certainly live in a time of great turbulence and uncertainty. Um, why should we all continue to look toward servant leadership as almost an antidote uh, to so many of the challenges we're facing today? It is definitely an antidote. Uh, and people recognize that. They would say in their, uh, in their, in their, when people get to the point of being very discouraged, and then you talk about servant leadership, that is the solution. I mean, that's, it's, it's the second thing they say. Um, or I hand them a little card and it has the, uh, the servant leadership statement on it. Um, they look at it, feel, why are we doing this? You know, <laughs> then you end up, you know, you kind of tell them what's going on, what's available. 200 videos we have on our Wisconsin website of stories of Wisconsin practitioners uh, and all the groups that get together every month, small groups and discuss servant leadership. Um, well, what if your boss doesn't do it? Well, then you end up with, you can start this right in the middle of the company. Don't go shouting and screaming, just have a conversation, share some information, do it consistently. So we have a little formula for that. Uh, all of that is a solution. Society is not changed that quickly. Uh, people don't change. If they're really good people, I call them oak trees. 
They're not bamboo. Bamboo grows 90 feet in the jungles, a tropical jungle, one year. Oak tree does not grow that fast. You know the rings on an oak tree. You can see it, it struggles, but by golly, as it grows, it stays. You know, Mandela, wow. Mother Teresa, all I want to do is bathe a person one time in their life when they were taken care of. We have a lady that just retired, was a nun, and I'm not Catholic, I'm, I'm the universal church. <laughs> uh, and she spent a lifetime with urban city children in high school, giving them an experience that's memorable for their life. That was her focus. And so they would put plays together, they would raise money, they'd go off to Europe or Africa or someplace and put their shows on. And it changed their life in many, many situations. Uh, it's a slow process. The world, well, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening. And we have some endowed chairs and one endowed chair has spent 14 years, two different um, people resided in that chair. And they have taken a major top 10 university in the country and redone their leadership programs. There's a master leadership program, and then there's 33 schools. And all 33 colleges, you might call them, I had to agree, the master program had to agree, but they did it from the bottom up in institutions normally that you know struggle to, to do move, move at all. Um, and now uh, this is, they spent 10 years integrating it. Now it's not servant leadership, but it clearly reflects it. It's far better than what was taught the previous 40 years, which is leadership is charisma. It has wow. nothing to do with morals and values. Right. And that's what was taught. Mm. The book was written and everybody used it. Mm. And that university now is has filtered that into all those programs and they're sharing it with the top 10 universities, really 13. And they're taking this and integrating it in their institutions. Ah. That is huge stuff. It does, mountains don't move that quick, but they do move. Mm. They're organic, did you know that? That's major impact. We have another question from someone who's curious as to how to introduce employees or mentees to servant leadership today. Uh, this individual wants to know if you'd recommend any, any particular books that would allow um, for the introduction of servant leadership to employees and mentees today. Well, uh, if, if I, I think much of this is one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, you'll have a lot of people who will be naysayers. They'll be intimidated that they're, somebody's going to take them over or something. Mm. There's, there's a fair amount of folks out there like that. Uh, the first book I hand them is The, the Case for Servant Leadership. By Ken Keith. Yes, it is just loaded with examples. Can you load that in, Darren? Um, the case for certain. Yeah, I got some. Darren's going to load it into the chat uh, for okay. our audience. And I tell them, you can read this in an hour and a half. Yeah. If you're interested in this subject. Mm -hmm. Another thing I do is I have a little card. And I just, uh, I hand them this card. Yeah, I see. Let's read it. It's an image of Mr. Greenleaf. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's the uh, you know the, the case for servant leadership, the best test. Okay. The back of the card are three people who have written about it that support the premise. Uh -huh. The statement, "Do those serve grow?" Mm -hmm. uh, is really a philosophical thing. Well, how do they grow? What did Greenleaf talk about? So you have all these principles you might call them. Um, and so I just hand it to them and there's a web page. There's 200 videos if you're really interested. Some people say you start watching them, you get addicted. You can't turn it off. <laughs> I've had people complain about that. Um, and what we're doing is all volunteer. So to pay somebody to do something may be required, but if it's the right stuff and you're listening carefully, um, you can meet their needs. And once they start experiencing that, they're going to start doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's how round tables, circles. On our Wisconsin webpage, we have a little under articles or 
I think it's articles or information that in there, you will find that. They're also on the, um, at the summit, there were people running them and there's examples of different kinds of people running them. And, uh, but they all have a general, generally the same technique, 60 minutes long, two breath introduction, uh, subject matter, and then never tell others what they ought to do. Share what works for you, what you've observed. Never tell the other person what to do. Listen closely to what's said and what isn't said. What isn't said sometimes is of greater value than what's said. Don't expect somebody to do what you think they ought to do. Let them do what they know how to do. Mm. Uh, those are ways of uh, that I've learned over the, over the years. Wonderful. And thank you, Mary Jo, for loading uh, a link to the resources just cited by Mr. Peeper. Our guests are uh, encouraged to um, access that link in the chat feature. We have another question. What aspect of servant leadership, what virtue described by Greenleaf do you find is the most difficult to achieve personally or for others? What virtue described by Greenleaf do you find is the most difficult to achieve personally or for others? Well, the most difficult is foresight. Mm. And every and where you look for foresight is with dyslectics. I'm a heavy duty dyslectic. And they have some voids, but they can't look at anything without seeing the long term. So if you got one in your company, let them speak. Some people might put him down because he has a reverse way of thinking, which is actually true. But that's the foresight. And the single most important thing to start with is listening. And don't start in the company. Start at home with your wife, your spouse, okay, your children. Listen for understanding. That is illuminating. And if you think out the answer, listen. The silence is great. The Regan Quinley had can't doesn't come to mind at the moment, but he had a great way of saying the importance, the profoundness of the silence. Well, basically, only speaking unless you can improve upon the the silence was. Uh... That's it. That's the yeah. one. That's the one. <laughs> Very good, Reggie. <laughs> um, we will take one final question, and I guess this is more directed to me at the center. Someone wants to know about the time frame for submitting and announcing the Scholar Award. So the application period for the 2021 cohort has closed, and we're pleased to announce that uh, the Scholar uh, selection committee being chaired by Dr. Lighton uh, will be convening on Friday and we will know by next week who our new Greenleaf scholars are for the 2021 cohort and so we invite all of our guests to stay tuned for that we'll certainly be making a big splash about this year's uh, scholars um, we are going to thank Mr. Peeper for uh, his time today um, but before signing off we want to um, talk a bit about how all of you who've gathered with us today can become more involved with the center um, to build on the wisdom uh, shared by Mr. Pieper today. Uh, if you are interested in honing your skills uh, as a leader, uh, becoming a great listener as suggested by Mr. Pieper, you can attend one of our Greenleaf Academy classes. Registration remains open for our key practices of servant leadership class that starts on September the 30th. Uh, we are also uh, registering uh, folk for our Foundations of Servant Leadership uh, class that starts on October the 29th. Um, you can go directly to greenleaf.org to register. Uh, we're also pleased to announce that we'll be hosting our first annual Robert K. Greenleaf Public Policy Lecture uh, in November. Uh, this will be all virtual. Uh, we're going to we're going to build on the lessons of the summit, Mr. Peeper, uh, and bringing some uh, thought leaders and issue experts together in November to use Greenleaf's uh, lens, his credo in particular, as a way of talking about current challenges uh, in society. Uh, stay tuned for uh, our announcement next week on our uh, October guest, 
for our October Coffee with Webinar series. Thank you so much, Mr. Peeper, for your time today. I certainly enjoyed hearing about uh, the early days, and I want a picture of you in your diapers uh, directing that traffic, by the way. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Please enjoy the rest of your September, and please stay safe. Thank you so much. One more, Ms. Peeper, yes. Yes, I, we people from our company go to these uh, key practices and foundations, and they find it very satisfactory. They get a solid base. Uh, the peer group is excellent. The moderators are terrific. They're the, the best in the business. Uh, so I would encourage you to consider that. And it is an honor, Reggie, to be with you on this platform and to be a part of this movement. It's a rich, rich place to live. Thank you so much, sir, for that plug. But, but thank you, as always, for just being you, um, having a huge servant heart. Um, and um, I look forward to my next chat with you. Again, thank you all for joining us. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.